short while, we will be hearing the oral arguments and presentations that you'll be making, respectively, for the complaining and the responding party. But before proceeding to that, I should like to just ask my fellow panelists to briefly introduce themselves. I will do likewise, and I will then call upon both delegations to present your delegations and the order in which you will be speaking and the time allocated. My name is Tatiana Sachse, and I'm here in Geneva for about just over a year, and I'm in private practice, focusing on international trade law. My name is Hans Schlimmern, I'm a director of WTI Advisors, it's a trade policy and trade law consultancy here in, uh, in Geneva, an affiliate of the World Trade Institute, uh, advising mostly governments, occasionally private clients, on uh, matters such as those before us today. My name is uh, Stephen Amar Singha, and besides serving as chair of this panel today, I'm working for the European Commission, responsible for organizing and running uh, WTO dispute settlement cases in particular. Now, I'd like to invite the complaining party to introduce your delegation and indicate the order in which your members of the delegation will be addressing the panel and the case. Please. Thank, thank you. Good morning, distinguished panelists. Learned counsel from Factro. My name is Zeeshan Afiz, counsel for WTO member Costa. I'd like to begin by introducing you to my co-counsel, Mr. Sean Kulkarni and Ms. Elizabeth Good. There are three issues before the panel in this current dispute, which my co-counsel and I intend to address in the following order. First, I will spend six minutes showing why this panel must exercise jurisdiction over this dispute. Second, Mr. Kulkarni will spend 15 minutes showing why this pet, why license B was a violation of Factoral's obligations under both the trips and the decision, and he will be speaking for 15 minutes. Finally, Ms. Gergen will also be speaking for 15 minutes, will address why license C was also a violation of Factoral's obligations. Following Factoral's arguments, Mr. Kulkarni reserves the right for four minutes to rebuttal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Council. So I trust that timekeepers have taken yeah. duly note of that, including the four minutes reserved for rebuttal, if remaining, once we get to that stage. I'd like to invite the uh, responding party to introduce your delegation and the order in which you'll be speaking. Good morning, members of the panel. My name is Mr. Strubov, and today, together with my colleague, Mr. Weberstedt, we represent the respondent in this matter, the government of Factorial. Today, my colleague and I will respond to the three issues presented by the delegates of COSTA. Mr. Weberstedt will, will respond to the issue of jurisdiction and the issue of licensee, and speak for altogether 17 minutes. I will respond to the licensee and speak uh, to the license B and speak for 20 minutes. We request three minutes for Sir Battle, and if granted, Mr. Weberstedt will present these submissions. Thank you. May I just uh, a quick question on your, you're applying the principle of res judicata, but in the context of the WTO dispute settlement, um, like what's our basis to take that principle into account? I mean, we have the DSU, we have the, the agreements, but what, what's your suggestion? Uh, how should we apply that principle? On what basis? You have said that the panel can invoke, um, is entitled to invoke uh, principles, uh, general principles of international law and customary international law. Um, are you able to point us to any cases where tribunals uh, adjudicating issues of international law have applied this principle of res judicata um, between them? In other words, tribunals in two different systems. In Mexico soft drinks, um, while the appellate body stated that as a tribunal we have the right to determine our jurisdiction, in that dispute, as I understand it, they said, but we did have the obligation to look at the dispute under WTO law, and we could not defer to a tribunal in an FTA. Now, in this situation, as I understand your argument, it's the fact that the tribunal in the FTA that Factoral and Costo are in has already decided this issue, and as a result, we do not, we no longer have jurisdiction to look at this question. And I'm just wondering if you could explain to us any legal basis upon which um, we can rely on the fact that a tribunal in the FTA has already made a decision on, on, a, on a dispute that may or may not be similar as um, a legal basis for why we would lack jurisdiction to hear this dispute today. 
Can you give us um, some legal precedent in case law, or can you refer to um, a treaty provision that would allow us to to resolve that difficulty? May I just interrupt you? So what you are implying is, if I understand you correctly, that if we if we find that we have jurisdiction, and if we come to a finding, you would just ignore this finding and you would just go back to the FDA regardless of the finding and regardless of the jurisdiction of this court? If you look at the facts of the shrimp turtle case and, it, uh, and then compare them to the facts in this case, if we decided that the measure that you are taking is justified under Article 20G, can you just tell us for our information, would we be, would we be going beyond the case law established under uh, shrimp turtle? Or is it exactly the same and to what extent would we be maybe going going beyond it? What is the factual difference here? Are you really saying, therefore, that when uh, we read in the agreement that a member has a right to determine something, that that is an absolute right? Because you seem to be suggesting that. Did you decide that there was urgency? What are the factors? And also, when it comes to situation of national emergency, the decision has listed certain diseases. How would you consider these diseases listed in the decision as indicative of the type of the type of diseases that can constitute a national emergency? You've referred to Article 31.3c, and that provision states that we may take into account any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties. Between the parties, I don't know exactly what that means. Does that mean? that it has to be between all members of the WTO or does it simply have, is that the only types of rules we can take into account? Here we're interpreting the DSU in light of the FTA. Therefore we're interpreting a provision in light of an FTA which is solely between two members. I don't know if the Vienna Convention allows us to do that. I don't understand how you can say that there is no justification under Article 20G or 20B and you need not discuss the shuffle. Because if I read Article 20G, it says relating to the conservation of exhaustible natural resources. You agree that whales are exhaustible natural resources. We have a conservation problem with whales and any measure that would even give an incentive to companies or whoever to reduce whaling would seem to me to be relating to the conservation of an exhaustible resource. So I'm not sure that your very narrow reading is in, in tune with, uh, with the very idea behind uh, both Article 31 and perhaps the wave of documents that have been built and piled upon it. Perhaps you want to comment on that. Yes, thank you Mr. Panelist for allowing me to clarify that point. Thank you, Mr. Panelist, for your question. As a matter of fact, that is, has been proposed by several members in the TRIP system. However, the state of Costo decide, uh, declares that that is not an acceptable measure for the following reasons. I would suppose we leave it here, and uh, we hear your uh, colleague, and <coughs> perhaps it's the same argument, perhaps the other arguments. We might come back to that. Please.